thinking maybe, hello, hello? It's getting there? Not yet? Now, can you hear me? Okay, perfect. What? Okay, so, all right, I'm just gonna jump in. Um, so I'm gonna be talking quite a bit about the protest ensemble anonymous, or fixing my other mics, I'm gonna move out in a second. And for people that kind of follow Anonymous a little bit, you might know they, they might be some of the most politically incorrect activists in the world. So a little bit of a warning, there'll be a little bit of offensive material that comes um, in the talk, but it shouldn't be too bad. So who here has met an anthropologist before? Wow, a lot of you guys. Well, that's what I am. I'm an anthropologist and we're not too common. Ooh, I'm gonna have to stand here, okay. So um, anthropologists are not too common. So when I tell people like, I don't know, my accountant or my doctor that I'm an anthropologist, they're usually pretty excited because I, they think I work in the jungle or with skulls. And then I tell them that I work with computer hackers and they get even more confused. And then I just kind of drop it. But I'm an anthropologist and since about 2001, I've worked on computer hackers and geeks. And, and my first project was on free software. And I like to tell people when I'm trying to keep it simple that I, I study the effect free software has had on people. And as you can see, uh, <laughs> it's the one drug. <laughs> it's the one drug that improves your life. Um, and more seriously, you know, I, I did spend five or six years studying it and it culminating it culminated in a book called Coding, Freedom, the Ethics and Aesthetics of, of Hacking. Who here recognizes the code that's in the bird? Does anyone know what it is? It's DCSS, uh, which was illegal under the Digital Millennium and Copyright Act. And it's funny, as you can see, the code's actually in Perl, uh, not in Python. And I was actually trying to make a joke last night about how you know, I wanted it to be Python, but that uh, Pythons eat birds. Um, and then actually I was like, well, is that true? And then I, I Googled last night, Python eat birds. Oh my God, there's very graphic videos. Pythons <laughs> do eat birds. Um, but that's not the reason why I didn't include it. It's just Perl was one of the kind of programs this book is an ethnography of Debian, uh, the free software project. I look at things like the governance of the project, I look at how humor functions among hackers, and I look at these kind of big political battles over software and code. Now I did something very foolish because, um, now does this work? Yes. Okay, good. I did something foolish which was right after finishing this book, I went ahead and wrote a second book which I don't recommend, you have no social life. And this book is called Hacker, Hoaxer, Whistleblower, Spy, The Many Faces of Anonymous. And while my editor came up with a flashy first half of the title, I was very insistent for the second half. Even though it's a faceless organization, there truly are these many faces of Anonymous. It's, it's a phenomenon that's incredibly difficult to define. And by the many faces, I mean that it's a protest movement, um, that it's a symbol for popular revolt, it is a set of activists who popularize digital direct action, there's competing tactics and groups, it's a meeting ground between art and politics or art and technology, and one of the most interesting elements too is how they symbolize anonymity, but within the collective, they really, really, really have a strong ethic against fame seeking. So with so much going on, it is incredibly difficult to, to define. And unlike my research with uh, compared to free software, where the research was quite straightforward and simple, the research on Anonymous was incredibly thrilling and frustrating at the very same time. And the next image, which was the original cover of the book, but then the editor's like, it looks too much like a 1980s video game, which he's kind of right. Um, the maze is the master metaphor of the book. Um, there is a tremendous amount of deception and secrecy in Anonymous, it's very difficult to figure things out. You feel like you're living the reality of a puzzle. Um, and just recently, someone on Twitter mentioned after 
uh, reading my book, they said, I would have lost my mind researching for that book. And I replied, well, I kind of did lose my mind at a certain point. I became incredibly paranoid. And the paranoia was kind of a low level barometric paranoia always with you. And then it would only shoot up when, for example, it was revealed that one of the main hackers, Sabu, was really an informant working for the FBI. And I was like, oh wow, well that's why he sought me out and we met all those times, right? So it was incredibly difficult project to study, very difficult to define. And another reason why it's also so difficult to define is because it's really this idea and a set of iconographies that are free to take by anyone. And that means, as a result, that patches are welcome by anyone, and you get really a, a strange and odd mix of contributors, and a little bit like how GitHub makes forking very, very easy because you just press the button fork. Well, you know, forking is incredibly common in Anonymous. There's groups that split off from existing groups. Other groups just kind of form out of the blue. So it's incredibly dynamic and chaotic kind of uh, social scene. Now, one may think that this name that's used for the purposes of political activity that's free to take by anyone is a new phenomenon. But in fact, there's other kind of similar groups that have existed in our near history and our far history. So for example, uh, Luther Blissett is uh, an icon and a name that was invented by Italian activists in 1994. And then it started to spread across the continent and all sorts of artists, activists, and hackers took the name to lay claim to various pranks. So that's one of the more famous ones in recent times. But if we go back further, in the 1830s, there were these riots that the farmers in England um, were organizing because there was the introduction of new machines which they felt were threatening their livelihood. And they invented a character called Captain Swing. And Captain Swing was this collective name that was taken by different um, farmers to lay claim to both actions and when they wrote letters of protest. So these are a couple of the, the sort of similar examples of collective name making that came in the past. But Anonymous is, you know, of the present and it's also a kind of world that's pretty geeky, um, filled with a lot of hackers. So I spent an enormous amount of time on IRC doing my research, just like I did with open source. Many of the operations were organized, perhaps stupidly, in public channels. Um, but this is where the activity really was. And one of the things as an anthropologist that I did was if you're hanging around long enough, they put you to work. And so I became a gopher not the gopher protocol, but a literal gopher, uh, between the world of journalism and anonymous. I taught more journalists how to get on IRC than probably anyone else in the world. It's a, a dubious distinction to have. But I got about 50 of them on IRC because there was a reporter channel. I, I translated during interviews. So this was one of my main roles. Now at a certain point, about a couple years into research, anonymous became a lot less anonymous. People were arrested. So part of my research moved offline and into prisons and into kind of um, courts. This is Jeremy Hammond, who's doing a 10-year jail uh, sentence for his activity in anonymous. Um, and I met quite a few, nearly all of the arrested hackers. Now, if you were in anonymous hacking, it was probably a good idea to be on the other side of the Atlantic. This is me in London at the Royal Court Theater with four members of Lulsec and Anonymous who had all been arrested, but they're already out of jail because they don't live in the United States. Um, and this was a play that was about Anonymous and we did a panel. So it was definitely able to meet people, which definitely changed the tenor of the research. Now, even though I've said anonymous is difficult to define, I do think that there are ways to define it. And so I'm providing a handy definition, which is it's an activist ensemble that's multitudinous, prolific, and unpredictable. And the fact that the name kind of has this open source logic where anyone can take it is one of the reasons why it's so prolific and unpredictable. 
And today, it's almost entirely associated with politics and activism. And this is really clear in its um, images and posters and videos that are made. It's about disobeying laws that are unjust. It's about getting involved in different political movements around the world, from Occupy to Ferguson. Uh, this is just an image from last night. Here there's big uh, protests in Montreal against austerity. An anonymous Quebec DDoSed a police website and took it down. So they're all very active constantly. But if today anonymous is all about activism, well, it's really then a historical aberration and mistake. Because in many ways, anonymous was never supposed to be a political thing. And someone in the fall who was part of an earlier generation of anonymous trolls told me this precise thing when he or she said, you know, anonymous was never supposed to be political. And I got a little bit scared when this person tweeted at me because I wrote a whole book about how anonymous is political. But then I just agreed with him or her, and he seemed satisfied and didn't troll me, which was wonderful. But it's, you know, he's referring to the fact that Anonymous was foremost a name that was used for internet trolling, which is a form of sometimes humorous, oftentimes extremely offensive and fearsome forms of pranking. Now, there's many different ways to troll. There's this idea that trolling only happens if you're anonymous, which is not true. One of the most famous trolls in the known universe is Weave, um, who is not anonymous. Uh, in some ways, he is the total opposite of Anonymous. He trolls for his own celebrity. But Anonymous was a name that was used on the image board 4chan to organize um, trolling campaigns. And this is a thread that was started early on in my research when Anonymous was still trolling. And it was a thread that was trying to get the army of internet trolls to you know, send me hundreds of pizzas and dox my social security number. And of course, my heart sunk when I saw this. And somewhat thankfully, um, the campaign never took off. But obviously, many, many, many campaigns that were organized on this anonymous image board 4chan did take off. And for, I, su I suspect here people know what trolling is, um, but I just want to offer one final definition that I kind of like by Whitney Phillips, who just wrote a great book about trolls. So trolls enjoy desecrating anything remotely sacred as cultural theorist Whitney Phillips conveys in her astute characterization of trolls as agents of cultural digestion who scavenged the landscape, repurposed the most offensive material, then shoved the resulting monstrosities into the faces of an unsuspecting populace. That's right, and you know why trolls do it? They do it for the lulls, for their own enjoyment. And Anonymous was so famous for trolling that in 2007 they were called the Internet Hate Machine by Fox News, Anonymous thought, hey, this is a pretty great name, and they took on <laughs> that moniker. Now, six months after being called the internet hate machine, there was a transformation, a U-turn, and Anonymous got engaged in activist campaigns. Now, how did this happen? Well, I'm gonna show you a short video clip that is completely, there's really two video clips that are completely responsible for the transformation. Let me just show you 30 seconds of the first one. But if that's what Mr. Cruz has brought to this world, there still remains one more word on the man. Call it Tom Cruise on Tom Cruise, Scientologist. Being a Scientologist, when you drive past an accident, it's not like anyone else. As you drive past, you know you have to do something about it because you know you're the only one that can really help. But that's, that's what drives me, is that I know that we have an opportunity and uh, to really help. So this video was leaked by Little A Anonymous. It was Scientologists, critics of the church who got this to journalists. It spread like wildfire. Who, who here has watched it before? 
Okay, so not enough. Um, watch the, the rest of the things, it's, it was hilarious. And you know, the internet was enjoying what was lulzy, even though it wasn't trying to be lulzy, right? And the Church of Scientology is very litigious, so it went after news publishers like Gawker and said, look, we're gonna sue you if you don't take that down. And Anonymous is like, hey, we're enjoying this video. You're gonna sue publishers? Well, you know what? We're going to engage in the most epic trolling campaign we have ever engaged in. And that's precisely what they did. So this is a quote from my book by someone who participated in this trolling campaign led by Anonymous against the Church of Scientology. The unified bulk of Anonymous collaborated through massive chat rooms to engage in various forms of ultra-coordinated motherfuckery. <laughs> For very short periods of time between January 15th and the 23rd, Scientology websites were hacked and DDoSed to remove them from the internet. The Dianetics telephone hotline was completely bombarded with prank calls. All black pieces of paper were faxed to every fax number we could get our hands on. <laughs> And the secrets of their religion were blasted all over the internet. I personally scan my bare ass and fax it to them because fuck them. <laughs> so. <laughs> so what happened next was about a handful of people went on a private IRC channel and they had this great idea of creating a lulzy video for the fun of it. And I'm gonna show you a short clip of it. Anonymous has therefore decided that your organization should be destroyed, for the good of your followers, for the good of mankind and for our own enjoyment. We shall proceed to expel you from the internet and systematically dismantle the Church of Scientology in its present form. We recognize you as serious opponents, and do not expect our campaign to be completed in a short time frame. However, you will not prevail forever against the angry masses of the body politic. Your choice of methods, your hypocrisy and the general artlessness of your organization have I love that, your general artlessness, which I'm gonna show an example of it. Well, this video was very interesting because even though it was done as a joke, it helped spark a debate. A lot of people said, you know, maybe we should kind of earnestly dismantle the Church of Scientology. And then ex-critics of the church reached out to Anonymous and said, look, your campaign was really amazing. Can you join us and just let go of the trolling, but become, you know, part of this sort of protest against the Church of Scientology. Well, enough people in Anonymous decided to go ahead with the experiment of protesting the Church of Scientology, and on February 10th, 2008, in over 127 cities around the world, over 9,000 um, geeks and hackers showed up in front of Scientology churches to protest them. The largest protests were in Sydney, London, New York, um, and Los Angeles, and they were of wild success. Now, most people came out to meet other people from 4chan because it truly is an anonymous image board. Other people are like, oh, you spend all this time on 4chan. It's so great to meet you. And a lot of these people just kind of receded back to the caverns of the internet. But enough people stayed on to protest the Church of Scientology every month that a new project, an activist project, Project Chinology, got constituted. Now, as you could imagine, a lot of the trolls were really effing pissed off at this, right? You are using the name of Anonymous for activism. We are a fearsome band of trolls. And in fact, soon after this activist campaign, the most notorious trolling campaign ever under the name of Anonymous occurred. And it was people seeking revenge. And this was when a number of people, I don't know how many, went to epilepsy forums and posted flashing GIFs. And this could endanger people's lives. And I mention this because it was a real serious transformation to have trolls become activists and some trolls were extremely upset. But what was amazing, and I was watching at this point, I said, wow, the name will never survive, but it did, it did. The name Anonymous was used to protest the Church of Scientology. Now, I had an explanation. I thought this was truly a historical aberration, and the only reason why there was an allowance in some ways for activism was because the Church of Scientology is the perfect nemesis for geeks and hackers. You can't have an organization that stands 
in such a kind of antipodal, opposite, inverted relationship to the geek and hacker world. And to give you a taste of this, and I think you all know why this is so, right? Scientology is a religion of fake technology and pseudoscience. Uh, but let me show you a document from the Church of Scientology which is called Keep Scientology Working, and it's their philosophy of technology. So, one is having the correct technology, two is knowing the technology, three, knowing it's correct, four, teaching correctly the correct technology, five, applying the technology, seeing that the technology is correctly applied, hammering out the existence of incorrect technology, knocking out incorrect applications, closing the door on any possibility of incorrect technology, and so on and so forth, right? This is not how geeks and hackers treat technology where you're supposed to bend it to your own kind of will. Um, and so I think there's a real pleasure in protesting your perfect nemesis. And I kind of chalked it up to that. It's like, oh, under the right historical circumstances, Anonymous became activist, but it won't ever, ever exceed a politics of protesting the Church of Scientology. But between 2008 and 2010, certain things happened. Uh, the name was still used by trolls. There was uh, campaigns still ongoing against the Church of Scientology. But really, the big player in town was WikiLeaks. Uh, this is from April 2010, when WikiLeaks released Collateral Murder, the video of American soldiers gunning down Reuters journalists. In comparison to WikiLeaks, Anonymous seemed extremely geopolitically insignificant. But then something happened soon after, in September of 2010, a new node by the name of AnonOps, which became its own dedicated IRC server, came into being. And it came into being to protest um, the copyright industries and to defend file sharing and piracy. And the unique innovation about this node was that Chinology had dropped DDoSing and hacking. Well, these folks picked it up, but not for trolling, but for political protests. Soon after, they would come to intersect with WikiLeaks. And that would happen after WikiLeaks uh, dumped the diplomatic cables, which upset the US government uh, quite dramatically. And as people here probably remember, the US government asked services that were uh, providing support for WikiLeaks, like PayPal, MasterCard, um, to pull the plug. And they precisely did that and this angered the internet, right? And Anonymous was in a very good position to then engage in a big DDoS attack against PayPal, MasterCard, and Visa. It was the largest DDoS um, protest action the internet has ever seen. There was 7,000 people logged onto one IRC channel. That's a lot of people for one channel. Lots of people were using low orbit ion cannon, and Anonymous was using its botnets as well. Now, soon after this, Anonymous gets involved in Tunisia and the Arab Spring, and this is the moment really when Anonymous becomes anonymous everywhere. They got involved in operations in Zimbabwe, Venezuela, Chile, the Arab Spring, and it really started to actually look like this. It was a kind of hydra with many different competing groups and tactics who were getting involved across the world. Now, one of the things about Anonymous is that a certain um, operation will change the course of its future. And there was one operation, HB Gary, that occurred in February of 2011 that brought out the hacking in a very public way. So there was a person called Aaron Barr, who was a security researcher that worked for HB Gary, and he um, basically had said that he had infiltrated Anonymous and that he was gonna give over the names to the FBI, and this was published in the Financial Times. Anonymous was quite upset, especially because most of the names were actually wrong. Uh, so the <laughs> article was published in the morning, and by the afternoon, H.B. Gary had been brutally hacked. Uh, they basically downloaded 70,000 emails, they deleted a bunch of files, they took over Aaron Barr's Twitter account, 
and this was this momentous act of revenge. But during the course of the operation and sifting through the emails, they found some politically damning information. There was a PowerPoint presentation called the WikiLeaks Threats, which H.B. Gary was proposing for Bank of America. And the idea was to discredit WikiLeaks by planting false information, by DDoSing it, and by discrediting and smearing journalists like Glenn Greenwald, who supported WikiLeaks. And the effect on Anonymous was twofold. First of all, a lot of the hackers grew into hacking companies just to expose security vulnerabilities. And LulzSec was a breakaway group that did just this for 50 days. They hacked nearly every single day for 50 days. Um, and then when they retired, AntiSec came into being. And they were a kind of militant hacker group looking for politically damning information through their hacks. So between 2012 and 14, uh, trolling under the name for the most part stops. Increasingly, you have a lot of global operations, and the name is used for very different types of operations. But you also had a lot of arrests as well in 2012, in part because the fellow with the FBI badge was Sabu, who was flipped to become an informant. He helped catch a lot of people. Um, but this didn't stop anonymous. It changed things. So in the United States, in Canada, a lot of the operations became focused on publicizing other kind of issues. Most famously, they got involved in a number of rape cases in Steubenville, Ohio, and Halifax. And a lot of the hacking then moved offshore to Latin America. For example, this is Lulsec Peru, who had hacked into the Peruvian government and found emails showing corruption. And the Peruvian government was one vote shy away from collapsing. Um, there was just an article the other day, a couple days ago, about Anonymous International, which is a kind of group that attacks the Kremlin, a Russian group. Um, so a lot of the hacking is occurring, but in very different types of play, or very um, not in the United States, where you're going to get you know thrown in jail for 10 years. So. For my last um, 10 minutes, I want to transition a little bit. I wanted to give you a little bit of a picture of Anonymous and how they came into being and how odd it was that they became an activist force. But I think one of the interesting things about Anonymous is that they're not the only player in town. Um, a lot of geeks and hackers are taking the political sword in greater numbers than ever before and in very different ways as well. Anonymous is only one kind of element in this diverse ecology. So Anonymous is the grassroots participatory direct action wing of a much broader set of trends. And WikiLeaks, in many ways, epitomizes this dramatic kind of transformation of geeks and hackers willing to take dramatic risks uh, for the purposes of trying to save democracy, expose surveillance. Uh, but again, it's a very diverse landscape with so many different types of actors. And geeks are building tools, writing free software, running technology collectives like Rise Up founding uh, political parties, and of course, whistleblowing and leaking as well. Um, and one of the things that I find interesting is that there's a lot of differences between, let's say, the political party and Anonymous. In fact, the political party, uh, the Pirate Party, begged Anonymous to stop DDoSing when they were DDoSing. And Anonymous is like, you know, that's what we do. We believe that this is a form of civil disobedience civil disobedience. So even though we have shared interests, our tactics are different. And I think it's good to have a kind of diverse uh, tactical landscape, but it's also important to have moments of unity and synergy, right? And we've seen many of these in the last couple of years. I think most dramatically, we saw that with stopping SOPA, the Stop Online Piracy Act, where so many different quarters of the geek world, from the corporate to the grassroots to free software, every kind of imaginal, imaginable institution kind of contributed with dramatic effect. And now I'm going to show you a clip uh, of Edward Snowden, 
uh, who needs no introduction, who I think speaks to the importance of free software in the fight. So let me just play that clip for a second. It's a really complex uh, topic, and I, I think when we talk about whether or not the government begins going after journalists, this is the real sticking point for me, because in terms of my political philosophy as it relates to technology here, is uh, I, I would say almost Stallman-esque. Um, when we think about free software, when we think about free software, uh, we need to think about software as a means of expressing our freedom, but also defending our freedom. Governments rely on the same technologies we do. They adopt the same standards. Uh, they use the same products. And this happens worldwide. So the solution to that, uh, when you ask me, is whether or not the United States government can manage to uh, behave itself, to restrain itself against violating the Constitution, against uh, bringing suits against journalists, against uh, limiting the freedom of press, other governments will make different decisions. And if we want to live in a better, more enlightened world, what we need to do is we need to remove those capabilities from the governments by enshrining our rights into our means of community. Okay. I, you know, it's funny because when I saw this, I, I hadn't known whether um, Snowden was into open source or free software, so this was a kind of nice confirmation of the importance of free software in the general fight. Now, as you can imagine, if uh, geeks and hackers are in greater numbers uh, engaging in leaking and whistleblowing and activism, well, the government is also then um, really going after geeks and hackers. And there have been a tremendous number of people who've been arrested um, in anonymous. There have been over 100 arrests around the world with very, very long jail sentences in the United States. Julian Assange has been under house arrest. Snowden is in exile. Others are in exile. And the government is pretty unhappy with these kind of um, trends. And in fact, the next image is a slide from GCHQ, which is about Tor. And they have a list of Tor that is, you know, the good uses and the bad uses. And the bad uses includes pedophiles and anonymous, right? So the government is not exactly thrilled um, that you have all these hackers taking political action. But probably the most disturbing trend is not simply that the hackers are getting in trouble. Some of them, after all, are breaking into servers, right? I mean, what they're doing is, is criminal, uh, even if one might say it's politically acceptable. But I think the most disturbing trend is that they're going after journalists as well, which is what Edward Snowden had mentioned. And here we have an image of Barrett Brown, who was a core anonymous activist. He was never anonymous. He always um, used his name. And he never hacked, um, but he was thrown in jail and faced a 100-year sentence simply for sharing a link to stolen data as part of a hack against a global intelligence firm, Stratford. Now, eventually, um, eventually, those charges were dropped. And he was, in the end, only charged for three things. He was charged for threatening an FBI agent, which he did on a video. He hid his laptops during a warrant search. But then he was also charged for what's called accessory after the fact. He went to the hackers and said, hey, I want to get the emails you got through your hack to put them on my journalistic website, Project PM. And for saying that, he became an accessory after the fact. And basically, he ended up, the judge said, the judge ruled that Brown more than merely reported on hacker activities, he helped organize them. And in the end, he got 64 months in jail and had to pay, or will have to pay, uh, nearly one million restitution fine, which is unbelievable for a journalist. Now, one may think Barrett Brown is an outlier, he was, charged and sentenced in Texas. As his lawyer said, it's always a crapshoot when you're in Texas. Um, but right around this time, uh, there was a really amazing article that came out in The Guardian that showed 
that the GCHQ had hoovered 70,000 emails in one day, in 10 minutes, and a lot of those emails were of journalists uh, from places like the New York Times, BBC, and Reuters. And um, what is really remarkable is that journalists were represented as a threat to security. And they were actually uh, a little less threatening than terrorists, but more threatening than hackers, which I was like, wow, how did that happen? You know, that's incredible. And now really just to wrap up, because I, I think it is quite disturbing that journalists are being tagged as a national security threat when they are the ones who are necessary to keep government power in check. It's disturbing. And I, I felt like I had to put together these two images of Xenu from Scientology with GCHQ, which kind of looks like an alien spaceship. And you know, a lot of us find Scientology so weird and unbelievable because, again, science fiction is the basis for their um, scientific mythology. The technology doesn't work. But if you think about it, um, GCHQ heralding journalists as a terrorist threat is even weirder and more terrifying, in my opinion, than Scientology. Scientology is more attackable in some ways because it's more confined, but what is going on with GCHQ is absolutely frightening. And just to finish, you know, a couple, let's just say about, well, basically until June 2013, I portrayed Anonymous as the funeral um, uh, at the funeral of online privacy. I was like, it's over. You know, there are just too many vectors and too many threats. But after the leaks, which also spurred the development of technological tools for encryption, I feel like the Reaper has been kept at bay a little bit. And what is so exciting about seeing so many people in this room is that free software does play an important role in that fight. So just to finish, I just want to say, keep on doing what you're doing. And thank you so much for listening to my talk. Thank you. Just mention that you can't take questions. Okay. I can't, oop, I think, I can't take questions, but I'm going to be around all day. So you can find me and, and ask me as many questions as you want. Okay.